you for coming out. It's always so good to share this sanctuary with people and let people experience hanging out with our residents. I'll tell you a little bit about Wildwood first. We are on our founder's property. Shauna is our founder and our board president. And this property has been in her family for three generations. Her grandparents farmed here. That's their pear orchard over there. They grew hay. Um, and a lot of the property, most of the property, is a nature preserve that's permanently set aside for native plants and wildlife. Um, which means that like most sanctuaries that start on their founder's property, we have outgrown this property. Now that we're 10 years old, um, we are using all of the space that's appropriate for animal housing. We're experiencing the effects of climate change. Um, our water well really struggles during those super hot days. Um, we were trying to only run the hose for one hour a day because we were seeing that the water pressure was getting really low and we didn't want to kill the kill the pump um, and we are seeing more dangers associated with you know living close to a forest with all of these animals so fire season now is a normal thing and a couple of years ago we had a huge fire that raged just right up over that ridge for over a week and the sky was just orange and we were all on alert, not knowing when we would have to evacuate. Unfortunately, we didn't have to evacuate. But then last summer, we also had a massive tree just come down on top of our um, waterfowl habitat and smash it um, after an ice storm. And these are things that just didn't happen 10 years ago that are happening now. So we are looking to raise money uh, to raise about a million dollars to buy a permanent property for Wildwood. And we really see it being a hub of education and activity and retreats for animal advocates so that they can stay resilient and stay in the fight for a long time. Uh, you'll hear a little bit about from Aaron about how difficult that is. And when I talk to people about Wildwood and how I ended up being involved in this cause, I like to tell everyone about the grieving dairy farmer who convinced me to be vegan many years ago. I was working on a, on a, a master's thesis about how consumer behavior is influenced by animal rights campaigns. And so a local church asked me to come talk about it. And after my talk, this man walked up and said, oh, I had to come here today because I saw that you were doing this talk and I'm a dairy farmer. So of course I was preparing for some sort of argument from him and he just started crying. He said he's the fourth generation in his family to run the dairy and that his daughter is an adult. This was years ago. Uh, I don't know what happened to them, but uh, his daughter at that point was an adult getting married and she and her spouse were planning to run the, the dairy. They wanted to be the fifth generation and they just knew that that was their future. And he wanted it to end with him because he told me that in the years that he had control of the dairy, he went organic, he changed the animal housing, he changed everything he could to make their lives as happy and comfortable as possible which I'm sure made some difference, but he realized that he still had to separate the babies from the moms immediately after they're born and hear the moms and babies cry for each other for days. And that then when the cows reach a certain age and they're less productive, he has to send them off to slaughter. So the two things that were just the most traumatizing and distressing for the animals are things that he realized he could not avoid doing and have a dairy farm. He had spent years wearing himself out, trying to have both happy animals and a dairy farm. And he realized that he couldn't. And at that point in my life, I was, I had been vegetarian for 25 years and mostly vegan, but I hadn't really, really adopted a 100% vegan lifestyle. And I think it was because 
I wasn't, I hadn't gotten really clear in my mind about the harm that dairy causes. We're all taught that it's just, they're just happy cows and they're gonna make milk anyway. Um, but they are like all mammals, they produce milk when they've had a baby and they produce that milk for their baby. Um, and so in order for humans to take their milk, the babies have to be removed from them. And then the female babies stay and they're fed formula and they're raised up so that they can be forcefully impregnated and they can become dairy cows. The boys are worthless. So they are usually um, just allowed to die or they're sold at a few days old for veal. So we have some cows over here, uh, especially Ferd and Valentino, you'll get a chance to meet them later. They were born that way. They were born on a dairy farm and they were useless because they are boys. And the sanctuary here was new and Shauna works at a vet clinic and she had let the farmer know that if there was ever a chance that she could rescue some babies, she wanted to do that. And so that farmer called her and it was, you know, rainy night and middle of winter and she drove out and they were so little, they both came home in the back of her Subaru and they were like the size of little puppies. Um, and you will see how massive they are now. Um, they are so huge that people will stop their cars when they're out here on the highway and just marvel at their size and if they see if they see people here they'll come in and they'll ask us how did those what kind of cows are they and why are they so huge and that's a chance for us to explain they're like all the other cows that you see in fields if you're passing dairies these guys have been allowed to live to full adulthood and reach their full size um, because animals on farms are all killed when they're very young so um Thank you all for being here. And I think right now I'll turn it over to Erin, or did you want to introduce her? Good. Yeah, okay. Uh, so this is Erin Wing. She is one of our animal caretakers and volunteers, and she is a former undercover investigator. She's going to talk to you about that. And she works for Animal Outlook now, um, overseeing the investigation programs. And she's part of our plans for our future sanctuary where we really would like to have support and retreats and meditation classes and yoga classes for activists who are dealing with the trauma of what they see when they're out there. So Erin can talk to you about that. I'll turn it over to her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so my name is Erin Wing. I have been involved in animal advocacy work since 2017. Excuse my notes if I was allowed to just stand up here and talk about every experience I've had as an undercover investigator, I'd be here all day, and so would you guys. Um, but nearly my entire career, I've actually um, spent working at Animal Outlook, which is a national nonprofit farmed animal advocacy organization based in Washington, DC where we conduct undercover investigations of farms and slaughterhouses across the country. I work in um, the investigations department with my colleague, Scott David, and we are both former undercover investigators. I primarily investigated farms growing and raising animals while Scott investigated slaughterhouses. And those two sides of animal production and processing, as the industry calls it, offer a comprehensive view of the entire process of producing animal products from the birth to the death of the animals being farmed. This is uh, actually my third year, I believe, <laughs> speaking to participants who have taken on the PDX Veg Challenge. And each time I've spoken in the past, I have just shared just uh, snippets about myself, uh, preferring to focus more on sharing as many experiences from my investigations as possible but this time I wanted to be a bit more open about just how I got here, if I may. Because uh, a lot of detractors of veganism will say that it's a diet of privilege, but really it is a lifestyle of compassion. And as a vegan animal rights advocate standing right here, I can tell you with full confidence that I did not come from privilege. The road for me was very rocky, very rough terrain to tread. 
there were very few opportunities afforded to me as a descendant of immigrants, as an inheritor of generational trauma, facing the challenges of systemic poverty and inequality. I wasn't able to attend the best schools. The areas I lived in were oftentimes dangerous. And most of the time, I didn't feel comfortable going outside to even play. There were days when I wasn't able to eat three square meals a day, and when I could, that food wasn't nutritious. And fast food restaurants were actually on every corner where I lived, while the nearest grocery stores were oftentimes over an hour away. And my family couldn't afford a car to drive anywhere, so corner stores with canned vegetables were the closest that we would come to eating healthy. And mass-produced, poorly regulated animal products masquerading as these cheap alternatives in urban food deserts were very tempting for desperate caregivers, like my mother, who worked long hours and just sought out quick ways to feed hungry kids. So fast food naturally became a staple in my diet. And it was a lot more common in low-income neighborhoods than in more affluent areas. That was the sort of inequality that stood out most to me. And as the animal ag industry is a huge partner in fast food production, it's interesting to note that connection that had persisted throughout my life between myself and fellow members of my community of having food that was harmful to our health consistently advertised to us and that the industry was profiting in a way from that. I remember watching a lot of uh, documentaries about our food system and seeing undercover investigations footage and being completely disgusted and so depressed after watching what these animals went through. And then when I sat down to eat a meal with chicken meat or cow meat, I would feel awful. And I knew I was perpetuating this harm but it was so common in my family for us to just shy away from how awful animals were treated for that meat and continue eating it anyway. So it became a cycle for me of feeling terrible for eating animals, but then forgetting that feeling and then seeing another documentary and feeling guilty and then forgetting again. And I wanted to break out of the cycle, but I did not know how. Then I met the first vegan person I'd ever met in my life at the age of 23. And I told her how frustrated I was with the state of the world at that time and a lot of things I was going through and specifically the immense suffering that I was seeing in the world and how powerless I felt in the middle of it all. And she told me if I wanted to help make the world a better place that I should be vegan. But why vegan? Why is that one of the best ways that I can help? At the time, I didn't know the answer, but I went out seeking that answer to that question. And I found it during my work as an undercover investigator. So my first investigation was at a chicken farm contracted to Tyson Foods. I think everybody here knows Tyson. On this chicken farm were nine sheds, and with, in each, shed, each shed there were tens of thousands of chickens packed into those sheds. And they would relieve themselves on the same ground that they walked and slept on. They never stepped foot outside to feel fresh air, feel the grass, nothing. That was not part of the structure of this farm site. And they were born at a hatchery, delivered to the farm, and for their first day of life, until their last day, they would stay inside those sheds for roughly 45 days, if they lived that long, long enough to be sent to slaughter. And so many chickens would die that the primary duty for the farm workers at the facility was to just pick up dead bodies. And even with two people doing that for hours, walking through each shed, there were corpses we couldn't see through the sea of birds just walking on top of them. And all of that was standard practice. It is the standard for chickens, chicken farms across the country to intensely confine chickens raised for meat, to breed them, to eat and eat and consume the feed until they gain so much weight that their legs break and buckle under, under their own, you know, excess body fat 
and weight, and that would render them unable to walk. It was a standard practice this farm participated in when workers euthanized chickens with their bare hands, these chickens who were sick or injured, that was the standard practice for getting rid of them instead of providing the birds with veterinary care. So while animals were suffering in this environment, humans were as well. So I worked alongside a migrant worker who was essentially overworked, underpaid. He lived in a trailer on the farm site that didn't even have a door on it. So wild animals would come into his trailer while he was sleeping. He couldn't get a good night's sleep. Uh, there was no protection from the elements, rain, intense heat or cold. And he had to beg the farm owner who lived on the farm site as well, ways away from the actual chicken sheds in a larger house. On multiple occasions, he would have to go and beg the farm owner just to be able to take a shower because he didn't even have a shower in his trailer. He didn't have a bathroom either. It's no wonder that an industry that profits from the exploitation of animals would do the same to the humans involved in the system. All of these necessities, fundamental necessities that this person was being deprived of was happening on the same farm site as all those chickens being subjected to so much mistreatment and abuse. That environment of suffering and mistreatment wasn't limited to the chicken farm I investigated as my investigations into dairy farms revealed. On dairy farms, as Michelle mentioned, female cows are forced to have babies that they will never get to nurture as their calves are taken from them shortly after birth and kept in crates away from their mothers if they are female. And as Michelle mentioned, the males were just frequently on the farm sites that I investigated, just either left to die or shipped off somewhere else. And their babies that are kept in those crates on the farm site would cry out to their mothers and the mothers would be forced to listen and not be able to reach them. And some mothers would watch their babies die and would be powerless to help them. In the milking area, which is primarily the places where I worked on the dairy farms I investigated, mother cows would have their milk taken from them in this area for human consumption. And I documented workers very often hitting frightened cows in their legs with steel pipes, wooden canes, and workers dragging cows with tractors after the cows collapsed from overexertion. And you might wonder, what kind of person would do that? Who would even take up a job like that at all? It's miserable work in terrible conditions for long hours and little pay, handling hundreds of thousands of frightened animals. What, what kind of person would take up a job like that? And what investigations work made me realize was that I should think instead about what the implications the animal agriculture industry has on our world. Then I think maybe someone who is desperate takes a job like that. And if that person is desperate, it's probably because they have very little options afforded to them. And if they're in that position where they have very little options, their lives are probably not great. So instead of wondering what kind of person would do that, I asked what kind of environment would put someone in a position where they would do that. Perhaps that kind of environment would be one where the standards for the treatment of farmed animals is to have them suffer, is to keep them intensely confined, is to just have them watch helplessly as, as their babies are taken from them, is an environment where the standard practice is to essentially cause these animals some type of pain. So an environment like that, which the workers are not responsible for constructing, which is designed by large corporations profiting off that suffering, these places that are breeding grounds for violence, for abuse, for despair, those places are dangerous for our society in more ways than one. So why vegan? Why, why care about animals specifically? I think we can define our own morality by the injustices we excuse, by what we accept of the treatment of the most vulnerable of our population. We know that animals suffer in this system. We know that humans suffer in this system. 
and what the implications are of supporting this exploitation on each level. When I was younger, I had a problem with all the issues I was seeing around me, but I was complicit even when I knew what I was eating, what I was purchasing with my money was inherently harmful because I believed that there was no other way. Because there's so much that seems outside of our control, especially nowadays. I can't control the world. I can't stop wars. I can't fix politics. I can't solve world hunger. But I really am just someone who came from nothing. But I can control my choices. That's one thing I can't do. And all it took was that realization that I could broaden my perspective, that I could broaden my circle of compassion, and that might contribute to a better future for all living beings. Then that was essentially what that one vegan friend that I met was trying to get me to understand. That despite what the animal agriculture industry wants to feed us by way of propaganda and the products they push out, to line the wall wallets of large conglomerates, basically. I have the ability, the ability to either engage with the knowledge of the true nature of animal farming or shy away from it. And there are so many different ways to resist this culture that's forced on us. One of the biggest ways is just not feeding it, not sustaining it, not giving your money to that. And nowadays I feel like we fear being wrong about the things we've enjoyed and participated in our whole lives. We don't like being wrong. We fear being inadequate. It puts us on shaky ground. But I think that the deepest fear, I think that I would point out, is that we are actually powerful beyond measure. Let's not fear being on shaky ground. As an investigator, I was on shaky ground for two years straight, going into animal agriculture facilities, not knowing what I was going to see. And what I saw shook me to my core. But it helped me find my voice. It helped me realize my agency as someone in this world who sees injustice, who sees something wrong, and knows that I don't have to just turn a blind eye to it. I can do something about it. And I hope you all realize today that you can as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, hey, I'm Ryan, or Wildwood Ryan. Uh, I'm the evening caretaker here, and I've been vegan for about eight years. One morning I was eating a sausage, and then I looked down at it, and it just looked gross to me, so I just stopped. <laughs> it's really that easy to go vegan. Like, it, it really is. Um, but a lot of the way, like, there are so many things that we're told to make it seem like it's not that easy. Like, uh, for example, eggs. Uh, we recently rescued, in total, it was, I think, over 400 chickens from a free-range organic egg farm, just over in Canby. And 27 of them, or 32 of them actually now live just right up there. And it's pretty incredible when you see these farms. Uh, this took about a week of planning or so. There was a Craigslist ad about an egg farm that was shutting down and they needed to get rid of their machines. That's what the chickens were called. Uh, the company was being bought and they just needed to get rid of their inventory. So me, a few other activists, uh, like Amber over there, uh, I'm gonna come back to you because you were really, really huge help in this. Um, we all started communicating and we got together, got Google Docs ready and we went in. Uh, it was very, very weird. We weren't too sure how this owner or this manager of this egg farm was going to react to a bunch of activists coming in. Well, we didn't say that, but some people coming in to take these chickens and give them a life that they deserve, like here at Wildwood. So he was actually more open to the idea or not. He even said that working at this egg farm, after a while, does get kind of taxing. Because the chickens, when they're not profitable anymore, they don't get to go live in an fancy farm like this, they get turned into meat and food, and they just get sent to a slaughterhouse. And that's not right. And when you see packages, it's just packaging. Uh, that They're organic, free range, they're happy chickens. They're not happy. Inside this facility, it just looks like a big, giant tin barn 
Think of a barn like this one, maybe about four or five times as big, just entirely metal. There's no natural sunlight in there. There's no natural sunlight in there, so the farmers, they're able to adjust the lighting inside there, and that'll force the chickens to molt, so they produce more. Eggs are really, really taxing on those little chicken bodies to produce. It's pretty sad. After about two years inside these farms, these chickens, they're no longer profitable, and they get sent to slaughter. And with this place closing down, they're trying to get rid of stuff. We wanted to give these chickens the life that they deserve. So the first day we were there, we got about 53-ish birds and got them all checked out at another activist's house. Uh, this was my first uh, kind of rescue of some sort, but we were really, really fortunate to have Amber there, who's not a stranger to this, and she was basically calling the shots and we were able to save 57. Uh, then, I think it was maybe about a week or so later, um, I get a text saying, now they're just saying anybody can come in, they can take them, we just want to get rid of them. So we just sprang into action. And I think there was maybe about eight or nine of us that morning when we went there. Uh, we walked into the farm, any chicken that we saw, we would try and grab and just put them in a cage. And these chickens are not big. When we go up there and see them, they did not look like that. They did not look as healthy. They were missing feathers. You can see their exposed stomachs. Their bums were all leaky just from being forced to produce and produce. That's all they're worth. It's just money. Uh, so that morning, we went in. I think that day, we left with over 300 chickens. And that was pretty incredible. Uh, did vet checks on all of them, uh, contacted people on the Google Doc that was set up that could look after them, and I took home five of them, and that was one of the most fun months ever, uh, looking after these chickens. They're really, really sweet. Uh, and inside this facility, it's, I took some pictures, and it's nothing like anybody thinks. The commercials, the advertising, it is nothing like that. It was pretty, it was pretty shocking. And then it wasn't even as bad as a lot of farms out there, but still, that's just not right to do to these birds. Like they have no idea. They have no idea that their lives have meaning. They know who we are. They know who each other are. They know to stay away from the turkeys and the other chickens that were up there before them. They're, they're smart, they're chickens, but their lives still have meaning. And, uh, one of the most incredible things, these chickens had never seen sunlight before. Uh, the five chickens that I got to take home with me, the first time I got to let them out into the sun, they, with their feathers, they just kind of bring out their wings and they just kind of start melting into the sun. They had never seen sun, they had never seen grass. And it's incredible to think that organic free range, it's, no, nah, it, it's more sad than anything else. And I'm thankful that you guys are all here to see these chickens and hopefully to share with your friends or hey you know free range organic chicken eggs there's really not as great as you think it could be worse but that doesn't make this any better and these chickens are just so happy they're so happy when we go there or into the hen house and you turn behind you you'll see like 18 chickens just following you around. They probably want snacks, but they just want to see what you're doing and what you're up to. It's really, really cool. Um, and I'm just so thankful that we were able to save the chickens that we had here and 400 out of, I think about 8,000 chickens were there at the time that we went into the rescue. And you would never ever guess that that was a chicken farm. And there's a reason for that. People might start questioning their food, is this ethical? Is this right? And uh, I'm not going to speak for everybody, but to me, no, I, I don't think so. If they're on the side of the barn, it said free range organic chicken eggs inside this tin shed, basically. They wouldn't make any money. So I hope that everybody here today and in the future starts to think about their food choices. And then I think the world would be a better place, not just for us, but for the animals as well. Thank you. So I think right now would be a great time to go over.
there. Yeah, yeah. let's go see some chickens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, look at that. What is it? So the day that we rescued these chickens, they were probably half the size that they are now. They had maybe two thirds the feathers on their bodies. And now that you could never even tell that they were being just used for their eggs and that was it. So were they initially afraid of you? Um, not really. Um, if I go down and, well, maybe she's brave. She just let me touch her. But uh, uh, they'll make way, but they're definitely not afraid to get up close and see what's going on. They're very, very adventurous and curious. Uh, quite often at night, I'll be feeding the cows or something, and I'll look out in the cow pasture and one of them somehow, I don't know how many times we fix the fence, they find a way out. And they're just exploring. How old do you think most of these chickens are? Are they? Younger than two. Okay. That one right there with the pink anklet, uh, my girlfriend name, that one's Chicky Minaj. Uh, <laughs> he's the rooster, so as you can tell, yeah. Krabby Patty. Ah. How do they get on with Krabby Patty? Um, they, they'll make way for the turkeys. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a few others and yeah, if the turkey comes this way, they'll just separate. <laughs> Patty. She loves all eyes on her. Yeah. <laughs> And then the first night that uh, 27 of these chickens first came here, they did not go inside the hen house for bed. They were inside the trees, they were in the bushes, they were in like anywhere that they felt comfortable and safe. And I spent probably about an hour and a half picking each one up, trying to catch them and putting them inside the hen house to be safe. And every time I put one in, like two would come out. And maybe like three would come in and then like one would come out. But now they're really settled into their life here. They go inside every single night uh, when it's bedtime, which is really, really nice. It's a lot easier than trying to grab them as they're trying to get away from me in the tree branches.
Right now, they're all taking afternoon naps. In the evening, they're very, very active. Is Patty the only turkey in there with them? Um, we've got three other turkeys in here. Uh, her sister, uh, Amelia, and then there's uh, Ash and... Yeah, there's a few other turkeys in here, and one rooster. Everybody gets along pretty well. It's great. It's great. <laughs> Certainly a better life now. Uh, yeah, they would have just been sent to the slaughterhouse. Yeah. Yeah, those are our chickens. Yeah, great. So maybe we'll go see the cows now. Oh, yeah. One of the ones from the dairy farm? I believe so. I mean, okay. he is a Holstein breed, which uh, they're the black and white cows, so um, he most likely came from a dairy farm. Um, we also have a couple of Jersey cows in the herd. They're also a dairy breed. Um, and then we have one other Jersey cow who is uh, out there. Her name's Lola, but um, the couple that are here are Spanky. Tilly and Moose, and they're the, the Jersey cows. And uh, Tino's the tallest, right? Brian? Yeah, I think so. And he's also the shyest, so <laughs> he's a gentle giant for sure. So, so what breed is Bird again? I, he's Holstein? Is Bird, yep, is he is Holstein. a Holstein cow. Which is the most, one of the most common fur dairy, right? Yep, definitely. As is Jersey, I guess. Yeah. Hi, Fur. Hello, handsome fella. I forget how large he is. And they can live up to 20 years, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but their lifespan um, for, for the female cows, which they keep, uh, is normally about five years. Five years if, if they can last that long. Hi, Fur. Hi, handsome dude. He doesn't seem to be bothered by all the staring at him. Yeah, um, I'll actually tell a story that just happened not too long ago, too, um, which I got on video, uh, where I was actually in this pasture um, with Ferdinand, who's all the way down there. He's the other black and white cow. And Ferdinand uh, was just really enjoying the sun, and he was, you know, sort of falling asleep anyway. And I, as I mentioned earlier, for everybody who heard the talk, I, I did investigate dairy farms. So 
I have a particular fondness for the Holstein cows in particular. Um, and I was in environments where they were not treated well. And it was really hard to see that. It was really hard to be an undercover investigator and have to do a lot of the same job duties that, you know, were sort of par for the course for the dairy farms I investigated. So anytime I can actually share really nice moments with these cows is great. And I was able to do that with fur not too long ago, where for the first time ever, I was able to, as he was lying down, here in this pasture, I was able to sit down next to him, really close to the point where we were just, you know, cuddled up together. And then as I'm sort of like filming myself with him, because it's like the happiest moment of my life at that point, he actually starts falling asleep and his, his head, his huge head, horns included, ended up resting on my shoulder. So he fell asleep on me. And then all of a sudden, you know, when I, I'm just like, you know, petting him and everything. I think he realized he fell asleep on me and he woke up <laughs> and he was drooling. <laughs> and that's how calm they are here. And it's really amazing to see that because that is the exact opposite of what they're experiencing on, on dairy farms. So it's, it's really wonderful. I mean, for me and I'm sure Ryan too, and all of our other volunteers here to be able to share these moments with these animals that we otherwise would not be able to interact with that way yeah so we get to know their personalities too like Tino Valentino is very shy uh, Ferdinand is a people person so he's fine with falling asleep on people that doesn't phase him uh, Miss Tilly Tilly is is also you know she likes her space um, and Spanky and Moose are more sociable they're more gregarious and they are very stubborn when you want them to move <laughs> and they don't feel like moving, they won't move. <laughs> and uh, Blitzen's also, he's, to me, he's like the most coolest guy because of his patterning and his colors. I think he's awesome. And I think his name is super cool, like Blitzen. Like he got pretty lucky with that type of name, but he's also really shy too. Um, so we respect their space. We give them their space when we need to. And we interact with them and give them affection when, when they're craving it. And they'll let us know for sure. And when they want to eat, they'll let us know too. <laughs> they'll yell at us. And, and uh, yeah, sometimes they'll, they'll try to trick us like cats. Like, you know how cats, <laughs> they've, they've eaten like 30 minutes ago. And then they'll be like screaming at you like they're dying for, for another meal. That's, that's how they'll act as well. Yeah, in the evening sometimes. Uh... Shauna always leaves us notes, and then she says, don't feed the cows, I already fed them. I'll come up here just to check on stuff, and then they'll just be staring at me, just like, well, you haven't fed us. Like, <laughs> like we, we want more. Especially if you've got carrots in your pockets, right? Oh, oh yeah. yeah, they can they easily can smell, smell those right. from, like, what? <laughs> in the car? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Oh yeah. So I've noticed I've volunteered a few times here, um, and I've had the, the pleasure and privilege of meeting Charlotte and Lola. And I was just curious, what, what, what was their criteria or reason for why some are over here and some are over there? Yeah, curious. it's a good question and, and easily answered too. Because when you see these these guys here okay. and see how massive they are, if you actually are in the pasture with Lola and Charlotte, they're they're not key. that big okay. they're small so they would definitely you know uh cows have a social hierarchy just like every other animal including humans and you know there is a leader who is tilly tilly's the leader and there are people who know that they're not so much the leader like in tino's situation where he's the biggest of them but he's not the leader and he knows it and um they've been together for so long and they know that system whereas if uh charlotte and lola were introduced them being so small they would definitely there would be some clashing there because it's just they've got they've got their own like sort of situation their own living situation over here so it's it's better uh for the two girls to be over there since they are so small and they get along fine i mean lola thinks of charlotte i think is like a older sister, uh, mother figure type of thing. It just seems like they're always together. 
Yeah. Lola's not too far behind mm -hmm. when Charlotte comes along. Oh yeah, definitely. I got a question. What did you do with your information that you got when you were undercover? Yeah, um, uh, actually my investigations were covered by the New York Times, The Guardian, The Washington Post. Um, so a lot of news outlets, uh, um, this CBC as well. Um, and we also do legal advocacy work it's, uh, as well. So uh, we pursue, you know, um, any forms of legal justice that we can for on behalf of the farmed animals. Because uh, fun fact, uh, farmed animals are not they don't really have protections on the farm site under the law. The only protections that really exist for farmed animals have to do with a 28 hour law. So it means that you can't transport animals um, who are farmed animals for longer than 28 hours without letting them out for a little bit of food and water. And then you can put them back on and then ship them um, some more if you want. And then there's the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, but that's slaughterhouse, that's transport. No wow. federal laws uh, protect farmed animals on the farm sites. The, wow. the farm sites can actually make up those rules hmm. on their own. Not and that's the what they AWA, do. Animal Welfare Act, not even that. Um, I mean, not really, no. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so hmm. that's where a lot of uh, animal rights organizations come in um, because there should be protections for them. They, sh sure. they should be protected from these rules that are sort of made up by the industry and they're gonna make up whatever rules are most convenient for them sure. to continue doing most what they're profitable. doing. And then yeah. the Humane Slaughter Act doesn't apply to chickens, right? No. Yeah. Hmm. Chickens are exempt from a lot of things. Yeah. Lots of uh, triggers. Like that. So they are just a little bundle of joy and they love to play. Which is just I don't know how big she's going to get, but that game is not a big game. <laughs> not worth it. <laughs>